This is February 29th, 1988, and I'm going to make a type tape recording this afternoon with Lowell Frouchy. I'm going to say just one more thing. This is Mr. Frouchy is a longtime Madison resident, all a lifelong Madison resident, who has uh, contributed greatly to many different beneficial activities in the city of Madison. And so we're going to introduce him now. Hello, Fauci. Would you tell us something about your family and your background, your Madison roots? Well, as, your you, Swiss roots. as you suggested, I uh, have lived all my life here in Madison. Um, my grandfather uh, came to this country from Switzerland, uh, leaving uh, Europe in 1866. and. Uh, arriving in Madison uh, and opening a business here in um, April of 1869 and the family that was the beginning of our family here since he Let's just stop for a second all together um, again no start right here, here in well then there will be a break again I thought a, that was no this is all right it'll, yeah it'll be just a pause uh, mm -hmm. My uh, grandfather uh, met in Madison um, a second generation Swiss girl who'd been um, born on a farm up south of uh, Fond du Lac but uh, came to Madison to work and they met in the church which they both attended and which played a very important role in the history of our family and uh, they uh, had eventually eleven children of whom my father was the oldest and uh, of the eleven uh, eight uh, lived into adulthood and uh, seven survived long enough so that they uh, became in 1927 um, the owner or I guess it was 1926 the uh, owners of the uh, business that my grandfather had established uh, in equal shares after his estate was settled. The business was um, a combination of the furniture business and uh, the funeral business growing out of my grandfather's trade as a cabinet maker. In the 19th century there were many communities which uh, had um, this type of joint business develop uh, because cabinet makers made coffins and uh, made or bought and sold uh, furniture. So they and, um, made coffins so they had to arrange funerals. And they arranged funerals and uh, uh, one of my uncles, uh, one of my father's younger sons, uh, was one of the first uh, licensed funeral directors in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, in the earlier days, uh, I'm not sure what the controls and regulations were, but um, I assume that it was more a matter of uh, just the physical work and uh, no special uh, uh, technology involved in the handling of the bodies and uh, maybe other parts of the profession which uh, gradually became much more sophisticated. Uh, my father was never uh, involved in either the furniture or funeral business uh, directly. Uh, he had a succession of careers as a younger man, but uh, uh, in 1910, along with some partners, had gone into the retail fuel business, and that was his uh, major occupation uh, from then on throughout his life. Uh, he was, however, as the older son and uh, well respected by his brothers and sisters, considered um, the head of the family in some respects, and uh, he was president of Frouchy's Incorporated and remained so until his death. Uh, Were you and Walter his only children? Yes. Uh, my father and mother, uh, like my grandparents, uh, met uh, through the same church when she uh, came to Madison uh, as a, from a farm down near Mesomene as a student at the university. 
my father uh, had not attended the university, but uh, through the church and the young people's organization of that church, uh, they became acquainted. My mother became a school teacher after uh, graduating from the university, but four years later, in uh, or five years later, maybe it was in 1900, they were married. Uh, my brother Walter was married or was born in 1901, and I followed in 1905. Uh, I had um, expected to uh, do academic work, and uh, after graduating from the university in 1927, I went abroad for a year and uh, then returned and entered the graduate school and uh, got an MA in 1920. Uh, nine, I guess it was, and uh, was continuing my studies when I had a change of feeling about uh, the uh, direction I was going, and uh, having been asked earlier by my uncle Irving Frouchy, who ran the furniture store, whether I would like to work there, I uh, went back to him and asked if that was still possible, and he said yes. So after finishing the uh, first semester of uh, the academic year 1929-30, I went to work at the furniture store in 19, January of 1930 and remained there ever since uh, until I retired you, after we closed out the business. You chose the wrong year to go from a prosperity standpoint. Well, it certainly was a, a difficult time uh, for everyone in the country and uh, I guess the world for that matter because uh, the, the depression uh, of the 30s uh, affected practically everybody uh, very adversely. The uh, survival of our business was uh, somewhat touch and go as was the case with many businesses and uh, my father and my two uncles, Irving who ran the furniture store and Arthur who uh, ran the funeral business uh, had pretty much to uh, put their resources on the line with personal commitments and all the cash they could raise to keep the business afloat. That was my introduction to the world of, of retail business and um, uh, it always gave me, I suppose, a rather conservative approach to uh, uh, matters uh, with respect to investment and expansion and so deep. on. That's right, knowing what could happen. But um, uh, meanwhile, I got married. Uh, my wife Grace had come to Madison uh, from La Crosse uh, as a student, and uh, we met actually uh, at Camp Indianola, where I had worked a number of summers as a counselor, and she was there in the office of secretary for the last two summers that I worked there, so that was <laughs> our way of getting together. That's a together. romantic place to start. It was uh, indeed Camp Indianola, now no more, but mm -hmm. it's now part of uh, the new state park on the North Shore. So uh, I'm very glad that that uh, whole property and much of the surrounding land there is now going to be preserved mm -hmm. perpetually as a state Beautiful park. park. You know, um, Grace and I had a long marriage, uh, we celebrated our 57th anniversary uh, last fall, and um, we have three children, we're in the focus of our lives really, and they've all done well. And we, um, Isn't it nice to be to around long enough to know your grandchildren? And yes, and we've been very fortunate and very blessed, I think, in respect to our family. Well, now, as far as my participation in public life, in a way, is in Madison, I, um, I guess uh, one of the earliest ways that came about was uh, when I was taken into the downtown Rotary Club. In those days, it was the Rotary Club of Madison, because we had only one at that time. Is and it a much larger group now? I was amazed at how large it is. The uh, downtown Rotary Club alone has now almost 500 members. Yes. It's, a, it's an unusually large club for a city of this mm -hmm. size. There aren't too many uh, uh, clubs of that size anywhere, actually. 
But in addition to the downtown club in Madison, there now are four or five others. Yes. Uh, so uh, there's a Rotary Club meeting uh, practically every day of the week, including in, you know, a breakfast club. But um, in the 1930s, when I was taken in, uh, the club consisted, I don't know the exact membership, but I suppose it was maybe 125, 150 members mm -hmm. maybe. And it consisted largely of the well-known business leaders of Madison and professional people and a uh, nub of um, uh, well-known professors from the university, administrators and professors. The and club, no women me, then, oh no, women now. Only this last year. Mm -hmm. That's been a very fundamental, substantial change. But it was a men's organization and um, uh, the it's one of the meeting places actually for town and gown, uh, the Rotary Club had a sort of rule of thumb that it would have a m membership coming about 20% from the university. And um, that I think has been a very wholesome and healthy relationship through this as well as other s service clubs. Uh, I guess I was taken in um, partly because um, uh, this would make five frouchies. Uh, members of the club. Uh, my, uh, two uncles and my father had been members for a long time. Then Walter, after leaving the university, uh, had uh, gone to work for the Democrat Printing Company, uh, where the uh, manager, owner, was uh, Heggie Brandenburg, a very active Rotarian, and he took Walter in. The uh, club is what's called uh, second active in his classification. Well, the same thing happened with me. My uncle Irving Frouchy, uh, who represented the retail furniture business in Rotary, took me in as a second active. And um, this made five members of our family, closely related, uh, members of the club, and the newspapers picked it up, and our pictures even were published in the International mm -hmm. Magazine of Rotary. Uh, Frouchy's of Madison, five of us. Did you have to have different occupations? Did they classify membership according to profession or yes business the, uh, one of the bases of uh, rotary organization is that one um, holds a classification uh, in rotary uh, and uh, originally those were uh, pretty clearly differentiated uh, but as rotary has grown and clubs have been become large mm -hmm. like ours uh, there had been um, many innovations. One was this idea of second actives, mm -hmm. uh, which my brother and I both were. Uh, the idea there was that uh, uh, the original members, in many cases, as they grew older and either died or at least retired from their businesses, often had were succeeded by people who by that time had maybe joined some other service club. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, with the eye, an eye toward sons coming up in a business or um, uh, assistant managers or other people in responsible positions who probably would emerge at the top eventually. This was a way of uh, bringing them in, before, in the same classification they were too old and to from the same company. Mm -hmm. But uh, then they began to divide up uh, a, a profession or a business with all kinds of distinctions, uh, making it possible for people who were really competitors and uh, mm -hmm. uh, who were in different business houses uh, to uh, come in under the same classification but with a different emphasis. In professions, for example, I think we must have at least 20 or maybe more lawyers in our mm -hmm. club right now, all given some kind of a designation of a different type of law practice that mm -hmm. they represent. In business, uh, well, uh, take the fuel business. My uh, father, I know, of being in retail fuel, uh, he uh, welcomed Frank Doyle from the Castle and Doyle Company mm -hmm. into Rotary, and somehow or other one, I guess, was oil and the other was coal, uh, coal or something. And yeah. they, those could be divided and subdivided and Higher uh, coal refined. And soft coal. Well, I don't know if that was an actuality, but uh, there were, uh, if I had a rotary 
um, roster here, I could show you what mm -hmm. I mean by some of these fine uh, distinctions that are made in order to open it up. And the whole idea of um, uh, getting uh, of Rotary being a place where people would meet for business and uh, support each other by buying from each other. Mm -hmm. I'll buy your suit, you buy my uh, Davenport. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, very quickly disappeared, although it had been among the prominent ideas when Rotary was established in Chicago in 1905. But uh, it's largely disappeared from Rotary now, and uh, I think competitors who otherwise uh, don't see each other all that often enjoy meeting at the. Yes, uh, and they, the Gibbs is in a, uh, sort of a, they're, they're a major block for for benefits to the city. Mm -hmm. That is, it's a large group of people who mm -hmm. perhaps wouldn't know each other at all except yeah. for Rotary. Yes, they get right. together and do a lot, of, a lot of good things. Well, in my case, um, I uh, became somewhat active in the club. I was elected a, uh, a director, which is a two-year term, sometime along in the latter half of the 30s. And uh, one of my responsibilities there was to uh, be chairman of uh, what was called the Inter Service uh, Inter Club Service Committee, and uh, we were given the responsibility for uh, trying to uh, arouse interest in the district conference, which was scheduled to be held in Madison the following spring, and. Uh, one way that we thought of doing that was to invite a representative of each club in the district, and there are then something like 40 clubs, uh, to send its president and other officers, or at least representatives, to one of our weekly meetings. And so as chairman of this committee, I started with the um, most distant clubs, whether very small or larger, and uh, invited them, and I think out of the 40-odd uh, clubs then in our district, uh, probably uh, some 30 or so actually sent people. And Did then they, uh, this was a conference, they all came? Well, every spring Rotary in the district, uh, all Rotary districts throughout the world mm -hmm. will have a conference in the spring, mm -hmm. but the host club has the problem of drumming up interest and, and people getting people come. to come. Yeah. And so this was uh, what we've been asked to do, is to try to uh, uh, develop relationships with members uh, of Rotary Clubs throughout the district and tell them to be sure to come when, mm -hmm. again when uh, the Rotary uh, uh, District Conference would be held in the spring here. And um, uh, so each time I gave a little talk of welcome to these guests who arrived and um, uh, with some research uh, at the library and elsewhere, I uh, dug up some facts about the town, whether Beaver Dam or Milwaukee or uh, Fort Atkinson or uh, wherever, and um, told what, what made the community tick, as I understood it, and some of the interesting facets mm -hmm. of the history and so on, little vignettes, five-minute presentations, all of which eventually got gathered together and put up in a book and there that is, sort of thing. There is a book, yeah. Well, the it's, uh, no, no, that I don't think is in the library, but um, mm -hmm. at least they've been compiled. And uh, so that was an interesting thing to do uh, for me, and also it helped me, I think, to uh, get known to more people mm -hmm. uh, in the community, because after all, this Rotary Club was where a lot of the uh, movers and shakers were. Uh, one of the um, illustrations of that was that uh, uh, I became a kind of spokesman for um, uh, a group of people who uh, were involved in a very heavy controversy then going on uh, over the building of an underpass on West Washington Avenue under the railroad tracks near the West Side Depot. And uh, that was pushed very hard by uh, many people because of the long delays uh, the automobiles having to stay while to stop while trains were switching back and forth right across West Washington Avenue. So the idea was to put a very long underpass there, uh, comparable to the much shorter one, which still is on Park 
North Park, Park South Park Street, yeah. uh, under the cracks there. And um, this was opposed by the Chamber of Commerce people and by a group of influential citizens on many grounds, uh, cost, uh, questions about the engineering of it, it would go of course below the lake mm -hmm. water levels and so on, but uh, particularly uh, because once built it would probably be there for decades and centuries maybe, and it was hoped that um, instead uh, the railroads could be persuaded to move out of town for their um, um, for their, um, what did I, I used the word already, uh, for switching yes. purposes and making up the trains. And so um, uh, some of those people were, uh, that I remember, well the State Journal took a very strong uh, position editorially on this subject against an underpass there and I'm quite sure the Capital Times was on the other side, as so often happened. But um, uh, Don Anderson of the Capital Times was one of the uh, chief organizers of this, Bud Jackson of the Madison and Wisconsin Foundation, people like uh, Louis Her Hersick, uh, Joe Rothschild of Barron's, Rube Neckerman, and a whole group of such people. Uh, they uh, employed uh, San Orr as an attorney to represent them. And San was a friend of mine, and as I already indicated, I was becoming somewhat known in the community. And uh, San asked me if I would be um, a spokesman for that group at a uh, public hearing on the subject, which uh, was held in um, the auditorium of uh, Central High School. It was known that it would attract a great many people and in fact the auditorium was filled and so there I was uh, after substantial briefing giving the arguments against the uh, underpass. Well the underpass never got billed, I don't know that because of my participation but it, it helped. in any case it was one of the things that uh, was of interest to me at the time. I got involved in other things too, uh, one of which was a recreation program for young people um, that was youth hostels. Um, youth hosteling, I believe, had started in this country in the East, in New England, uh, appealed particularly to college age students who did a lot of bicycling and uh, uh, for their use and uh, for uh, making a wholesome program out of it. Uh, hostels were set up. Uh, which had house parents and um, uh, proper facilities, uh, met conditions of hygiene and so on, which were desirable. And uh, that gradually spread westward and uh, was picked up by some people here in Madison. One of the ringleaders was uh, Mrs. Elmer Severinghouse, uh, Mrs. Grace Severinghouse, who uh, I guess was maybe the one who got me involved, but uh, we had a committee which worked at it very hard, and my um, my responsibility was to uh, create trails, and uh, we also, uh, in connection with developing a trail which I s which bicyclers could follow, um, we had to find uh, places which would become youth hostels where they could stay. And we eventually set up a, uh, a uh, circle of five um, uh, youth hostels. One was a farm near Cross Plains. Uh, one was um, a, uh, a quaint stone structure on the north slope of Blue Mounds, which uh, had been built by Professor Dixon of the university here. It had never been finished. He had used it as a weekend uh, project for himself and his sons as they were growing. Um, built out of timbers and stone, it uh, looks something like the House of Snow White in the, in the woods. But um, as I said, it had never been finished. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Dixon was staying here or 
was leaving the university, but at least his sons had got beyond the age where this was of interest to them. And so uh, with him it was arranged that that would be a youth hostel. Uh, house parents would be installed for the summer season, but the building had to be finished. And uh, I remember um, not only the building, but the surrounding grounds. I remember spending a couple of weekends out there on work parties, uh, helping to get that place in shape. It's the home that uh, is, for many years now, been uh, lived in by Professor Johansson of the School of Music. It has a perfect recording room in it, doesn't it? I believe it does, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, it's had additions to it, I think, and certainly uh, uh, features built there which weren't there when we fixed it up as a youth hostel, but <laughs> nevertheless it must look much the same. I haven't seen it for years. Another one of these um, uh, youth hostels was the Sky High Farm up on the summit of Variable Hills, uh, still there, yes. a place where you can buy apples yes, uh, at Sky High Orchards. Beautiful place. Yes, and uh, still another one was uh, near O'Kee on this side of the Wisconsin River, uh, where uh, an elderly uh, couple uh, agreed to uh, take in the youth hostlers and supervise it. And so we had that um, circuit, and uh, as trail chairman, I spent quite a lot of time and effort uh, putting up the markers that had been Could developed. Can I made. ask you about the trails? Are these, you, you used roads where it was possible? Yeah, you know, they were all roads, all and roads. Uh, not, not the main highways, they were mm -hmm. back roads. You usually gravel. Uh, it so wasn't trails that you cut through the woods. Oh, no, no, these were bicycle trails, not mm -hmm. hiking trails. and. Uh, because the distance was substantial, I yes. suppose that total circuit was well over a hundred miles. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if one, oh, the, the other one I didn't mention was right here in the edge of Madison, the post farm at the yeah. entrance to Sherwood. Sure. The posts were um, uh, house parents for uh, for their youth hostel and right on their property and very interested and helpful uh, in doing some of this physical work uh, elsewhere even. But um, uh, in putting up these markers, which were uh, triangular things, as I recall, about six inches on a side, uh, cut out of a sheet of tin or metal of some sort, and um, painted, I believe they were red, painted red, and that was done by another committee. But then I had quantities of things, and I went out and put them along the roads, which were the connecting links between the hospital, or between the hostels. Uh, if the flat side of the triangle was down and the point was up, it meant keep going the road you're on. But if you were to turn right, uh, then the point was toward the right. Mm -hmm. and if the apex of the triangle was to the left, that meant you turn that way. So uh, that worked pretty well. Well, then came our uh, entrance into World War II, and um, the government opened up the Badger Ordnance Plant on the Salt Prairie, and uh, very rapidly that was developed and began to attract thousands of workers who uh, were quartered uh, all over the southwestern part of Wisconsin. Uh, some of them, I think, must have driven 50, 60 miles each day. Well, of course, every one of these places that we had made into a uh, youth hostel uh, was absorbed into this uh, mm -hmm. need for uh, places where uh, workers at Badger Ordnance mm -hmm. could live. So the, uh, and anyway, uh, a lot of the young people who might have been bicycling were off Not the so war nice. or doing something else. And uh, so the whole program just came to a halt all of a sudden. After the war, um, uh, some man, very attractive fellow, out of uh, the East, I think it was headquartered in Boston, the National Youth Hostel Movement, uh, came to Madison a couple of times trying to reestablish the program here, but uh, at that point I was not in a position to give it any time, and apparently others weren't either because it never got that started here again. Again, people chose different ways of traveling. That's right. Um, Automobiles were Youth hosteling continued, I think, for quite a long time, but it became all, practically worldwide, and um, such 
fancy things as trips where youth hostlers could get on a train and uh, go across Canada mm -hmm. by train and then you just bicycle, you know, in the mountains or something like that. Uh, so it wasn't uh, all that kind of a homegrown no. enterprise that we had had some very few years earlier. Yeah. But I don't know that, uh, well, there are thousands more bicycles now than there were in those days, of course. It, kind of a dangerous thing okay. and I suppose any organization that sponsored it would have almost an impossible time uh, with just with liability insurance maybe if it were trying to there take people There are some people such as you and I both know who still ride their bicycles. Oh yes. Maybe. In the Rocky Mountains. Or yes, or down, down our main streets. Well, uh, another thing that I got involved in, uh, in the three as a uh, way of raising funds for uh, a number of agencies that banded together to uh, do this. Um, uh, Judge Rosenberry had been one of the founders. Uh, there were many other people whose names would be familiar still who were active in setting it up in those early days. Uh, my father, who uh, had been active in one or two agencies, I think particularly family service, uh, became an early uh, part of the organization of the community union and was um, president of it and also headed the campaign uh, one year in the latter part of the 20s, I think 26 or 27. And it has been a focal point of interest and participation uh, for members of the Frouchy family ever since. I uh, got involved uh, personally um, when uh, Charlie Burt, who was the uh, director of the uh, community union and a personal friend, um, asked me uh, if I would become a member of the budget committee. Uh, this was an important part of the community chest uh, process to receive uh, the budget requests from all the different agencies to review them carefully and then to make recommendations which went into the formation of the uh, annual campaign goal and also uh, was a way of uh, creating some sort of community control over what these agencies were doing uh, and uh, kind of results they were producing and so on. Uh, I spent four years as a member of that uh, committee, uh, the latter uh, two of the four as chairman of the committee. And I think during those four years we brought the whole process to a much more thorough and orderly uh, uh, basis than uh, it had uh, had previously. Uh, that led to my being elected uh, president of the community union, which was in 1943, and I was president for two years. Uh, however, those were war years, and uh, everything had changed very substantially. Uh, the community union during the Depression years of the 30s had uh, dropped in its fundraising to well below a hundred thousand dollars. I think uh, maybe at the bottom of the depression it was able to raise only sixty or seventy thousand uh, for all the believe. agencies which were dependent on it for at least part of their support. Uh, during the late twenties uh, I think the amount raised was in the neighborhood of a hundred and twenty five to hundred and fifty thousand. So it was a very substantial decline with uh, with much more challenges by the way of community needs. And um, in 1941, after Pearl Harbor, when we entered World War II, uh, immediately there were uh, appeals which uh, came from the Red Cross and from the International YMCA and from uh, all manner of different, uh, either UF, what was it called? What were the, well, the recreation program? The, yes, uh, for uh, service personnel. Mm -hmm. Term doesn't come to mind, but anyway, those uh, 
various uh, appeals all were pouring into Madison and so the uh, people who uh, managed this sort of thing uh, felt uh, that there should be one uh, large effort, one umbrella organization to take care of our local needs through the community union and also all of these wartime appeals in one asking. And um, a new organization called the War Chest was set up with uh, Frank Ross as uh, president of it. He had previously been president of uh, the community union. Carl Warmington, who was director of the community union, uh, also uh, became director or secretary of the War Chest. Uh, Joe Ford, an, an industrialist who uh, headed the Ceylon Company, um, was asked to be campaign chairman and accepted. And um, he uh, he uh, gave a remarkable performance. I will never forget being at a meeting when uh, he announced that instead of uh, shooting for the goal which was uh, a combination of the various uh, the sum of the various askings, the local ones, these wartime appeals in the neighborhood, say $225,000 to $50,000, um, he was going to shoot for 400000 And that seemed uh, kind of electrifying and seemed impossible. But um, he had uh, laid the groundwork by um, talking to some of his fellow um, executives around the different industrial plants of Madison and um, saying that they all had to uh, kick in um, amounts that they had not considered ever before and um, tied it in with um, their labor relations. He got the uh, unions and the union leadership of Madison to go along with this and one of the things that the employers were going to do, uh, it was all kind of a package deal, was to uh, uh, raise wages. This was before wage control was imposed by the government and uh, this would be somewhat of an offset, at least it was a, uh, an attraction for the workers who in turn uh, uh, pledged that uh, there would be uh, uh, compulsory or uh, required uh, giving to the war chest uh, by all of the members of the union in a given plant uh, at various rates, but uh, I think the minimum that was talked about was a dollar a month. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of withholding originated at that time. This was actually deducted from the wages and paid into the war chest. Well, $12 a month, or some plants, 24 or $36 a month, I mean, uh, a year, yeah. uh, of course, added up to real dollars. And um, people who before had not given anything to the local drive, or maybe who would give $5, you know, even if there were 15 agencies, and think that was enough, so found themselves almost without pain uh, giving 12, 24, and 36 and more dollars a year. And meanwhile, the uh, uh, employers, company, and uh, other professional people in Madison and so on all responded in somewhat in proportion. So the um, campaign that first year went way over uh, the $400,000 that it was aimed at. And that happened each of the four years we were in the war. Uh, with the idea that the excess over the amounts budgeted would go into a trust fund, which at first was thought of as a kind of rainy day fund because it was generally expected that there would be a um, uh, recession or a decline in economic activity after World War II, just as there had been in 1921, I think it was, after World War One. Well, it never happened. Never happened yeah. No, uh, for some reason or other, the uh, economy uh, continued on an upward trend uh, throughout the 40s and uh, on well into 
the 70s. There were such, so many unmet needs that manufacturing had to go on. People needed yeah. houses and yeah. the furniture and yes. appliances. I guess so. In any case, uh, we avoided perhaps some of the mistakes that had been made uh, in the early, in the late teens and the early 20s. And for whatever reason, uh, the uh, economy was robust. Uh, for which reason, the um, a community trust fund um, never had a uh, use as a rainy day fund, although income from it did supplement uh, uh, various social needs in Madison mm -hmm. over a period of time. But on the whole, uh, the uh, fund was largely uh, neglected. Uh, it was didn't grow very much. It was the money was not invested in productive ways, which mm -hmm. could have increased it manifold. But um, uh, all that changed a number of years ago, and under some uh, very thoughtful uh, work by uh, a number of community leaders, uh, the thing got revitalized. Uh, Carol Tucson went to work uh, as a staff member for it. And uh, then later, uh, Mrs. Jane Coleman uh, headed it, and under her leadership, uh, the thing has uh, taken off so that uh, by soliciting um, the incorporation of other trust monies in there uh, for a variety of purposes uh, and in various ways, which is too complicated for me to try to explain, uh, they have you know, something like doubled and tripled mm -hmm. the amount uh, that was there when she took over only about uh, two or three years ago. And uh, this uh, organization, which has had its name changed now to United Madison Community uh, Fund, is, I think, a uh, tool that will serve this community very, very well over the indefinite future. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, those are... Uh, well, let's see, that takes me through the things that I got involved in pretty much through the 40s. Um, after the war was over, I uh, uh, remained involved with the community union. Um, one of the things perhaps I could bring in here, uh, in late 1944, while the war was still on, after the uh, annual war chess campaign. Uh, Mr. Avio, on his uh, weekly broadcast, uh, which I think is called Hello Wisconsin, is his voice trembled. In his voice, yes. <laughs> but he always was firm in what he said. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, expounded, in I think more than one broadcast, his views about uh, uh, social work social welfare agencies at the private level, and he didn't think much of those. Uh, I believe that this was somewhat characteristic of uh, the uh, progressive party's point of view. Uh, I'm quite sure that members of the La Follette family uh, always had the uh, theory that uh, the uh, way to handle our social ills is through government initiatives and uh, organizations. And um, yeah, this, uh, private agencies were suspect of. Personal well, they were suspect. There could be uh, there could be uh, troubles in within them, but uh, I think uh, largely they uh, were regarded as not being able to handle the job. Mm -hmm. They weren't big enough. They. Uh, didn't have the resources that could be mobilized by government. And uh, whatever the arguments were, and I don't remember the specifics of it too much, they were being repeated elsewhere. The uh, Washington Post at that same time was um, running editorials saying very much the same, so it was a kind of a national debate. But here in Madison, uh, of course, it was aimed particularly at the community union, uh, which was still called that. Uh, in, become the United Community Chest until sometime in the 50s. And uh, this was, of course, a uh, direct attack almost on uh, what was being undertaken here and worked at so far and faithfully by an awful lot of people. 
So I was still president of the uh, community uh, union, um, discussed all this as a kind of a challenge with um, Carl Wilmington, who was the secretary of the community union. And then I wrote a uh, piece which I called Credo, in which I set down a series of affirmations. First, about the value of social work and, or the need for social work in our society. Secondly, uh, the uh, the role of private um, social agencies uh, working in tandem with government undertakings, which by that time were very numerous. And um, thirdly, about the community union specifically as an organization and its member agencies. So that um, uh, I read at the annual uh, meeting of the um, community union where the election was held and I was replaced as head of it. But uh, the uh, credo was well received, was picked up by the Madison newspapers and uh, written uh, about in length and uh, was uh, then copied all over the country, uh, sometimes uh, giving the source of it, but in many other cases just being printed with the same words over the name of whoever happened to be the officer of some local chest. It's your contribution to the national welfare. And to the literature. Well, uh, Ms. Helen Clark, professor of social work at mm -hmm. the university, in one of her books devoted a whole chapter to this. Uh, the um, have you in the Washington Post um, uh, editorials and uh, announced pronouncements, and uh, then the local involvement, not only my credo, which was printed in full, but, uh, and Mr. Evu's statements have been printed at mm -hmm. length too in this chapter, but also uh, contributions from people like Professor John Gillen, Sociology mm -hmm. Department, University, and so on. So, uh, it's a very I am, I'm sort of embalmed in print through all of that. Well, you're the businessman, the, yeah. the captured businessman. The captured businessman. And I think uh, there, there has been, there was at that time a very fruitful kind of discussion and examination of what the agencies were supposed to be doing. And mm -hmm. I think they probably all improved themselves. I think it was a healthy discussion, mm -hmm. yes. Now, there is no no institution which should be above inquiry and uh, reevaluation, and uh, I think that uh, this, the very fact that it was national, mm -hmm. and um, that it stirred a lot of people locally too. Got rid of the symbol of the little old lady with her tennis shoes and her yeah. basket. Yeah, that's right. Uh, then the Community Welfare Council was founded in 1949. I had been uh, chairman of the uh, planning, what is called a planning committee for the uh, community union, uh, which was supposed to think about uh, local problems and how to handle them, and uh, feeling that this had somehow or other to be um, more institutionalized and also uh, incorporate other agencies which were not part of the community union. Uh, we uh, came up with the idea of having a, a, a welfare council. Called it the Community Welfare Council. Uh -huh. Finally got organized in 1949 and I served as president of that then for three years and was a director for some time after that. And I think uh, that uh, organization uh, did many constructive and useful things through the years. Uh, it finally reached a point somewhere in the 1960s, I was not part of it at that time, but uh, uh, it was felt that uh, the uh, public agencies also ought to be associated with the private agencies, both those in the community chest and those which are outside the community chest but private agencies. They should have a common organization. And so, uh, I think it was called the Dane County, um, what was it, Dane County uh, Welfare uh, Association or something. Anyway, it was made uh, broader and it was supported in part by 
the county and city governments, as well as a contribution from the community union and uh, head of staff, of course. But uh, that ran into trouble down the line and eventually petered out so we don't have anything like that anymore. And uh, through just a natural evolution, I guess the uh, whole process of planning for the community has tended to center itself again more in what's now called the United Way, which is the successor organization to the things I've been talking about. I uh, did get involved again uh, while the community union, I mean, excuse me, the community welfare council was still going in uh, an incident called the Brockway case in the early 60s. That was a situation where a, a young couple brought a sick baby into one of the hospitals one night and uh, it died during the night and uh, this was widely written about in the newspapers and there was a great deal of outcry about uh, the fact that this had been allowed to happen. That they, they hadn't been turned away from the hospital? Well, I can't remember whether that had happened. I don't think so, but uh, there had been contact with quite a good many different agencies mm -hmm. in one way or another. This uh, was a this was a family which had a father and a mother, but um, they were poor. They were not well educated. Mm -hmm. They uh, needed help, and uh, whatever the reasons, they apparently hadn't been getting. Uh, the help they needed or the right advice. And um, so, again, here was the whole matter of uh, what's happening to all this money we raise every year for these agencies and are paid for through taxes, and yet things like this can happen in Madison, Wisconsin, and all places. So the uh, president of the uh, Community Welfare Council, who was then Gordon Sinekin, asked me if I would head a uh, committee of inquiry to see what had happened and to make recommendations. And um, he appointed a committee of 20, 25 people, including medical people, social workers, university people, and um, uh, represented both newspapers. And we had a whole series of meetings. Um, interesting experience because these were well-informed people all concerned uh, not only about Rockwood baby and the parents but also about uh, uh, the image that uh, these agencies uh, had somehow rather suddenly yeah. in, yeah. in Madison and um, then uh, after our series of hearings and discussions and so on I wrote a report which was released and that was very well received by the newspapers. The whole issue uh, went away, died down. Uh, I think the only uh, real recommendation that got implemented was a uh, new uh, uh, committee uh, for communication uh, among the agencies to meet regularly uh, and to um, keep each other informed about their processes and to try to see where uh, loopholes could occur that somebody would somehow or other not get the right reference. And, and also to eliminate waste and duplication in there. Yes, all that of course. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm sure that particular mechanism has long since uh, been superseded by other things, but on the other hand for a while it I'm sure helped to improve the situation and also uh, allowed the, the turmoil to, mm -hmm. to die down. Uh, another thing that the Community Welfare Council did during those years was to uh, arrange for a, uh, a survey of the health um, delivery system that we have here in Dane County. And uh, funds were raised uh, in a variety of ways some privately, but uh, the city and county both put in, I think, substantial amounts. And a firm called the Steinley Organization was brought to Madison to make a study of, of these matters. Uh, it was divided into uh, several segments, the major one having to do with the hospitals, but uh, also um, 
nursing services uh, outside and the, uh, the health organizations that are, uh, of course, sort of thing we've been looking into with the, uh, in the Brockway case. And um, uh, a report was published, I think in 1961, uh, called the Steinle Report, uh, which uh, made innumerable suggestions as to things that Madison and Dane County as a whole needed. And um, uh, in order that that committee not, I mean that that report not just uh, be filed away and forgotten, uh, it was determined that there should be follow-up committees to uh, try to implement the, or examine the recommendations and then implement them if desirable. And I was asked if I would chair a committee on hospitals, which uh, was a new involvement for me just at a time when I had uh, been phasing out a lot of these uh, things that I'd been engaged in previously. And I thought about it very carefully, went and talked to the administrators of all four of our hospitals, um, and uh, asked them about their opinion of the report and its recommendations and uh, whether uh, committee work of the type proposed would be productive and worthwhile, investment of time and effort it would need. And all of them urged me to take it on and I decided to do so and it turned out to be an extremely interesting and valuable experience for me, I think. The committee was an excellent one. Uh, the four administrators were all active on that committee and doctors and a variety of citizens with interest in this uh, area. And um, out of that committee on hospitals, which I think was in existence for about two years or maybe a little more, uh, we made two proposals, both of which uh, came about. Uh, one was uh, to um, um, set up and organized legally uh, the United Hospital Fund of Dane County, which would uh, put on a fundraising drive to get the money, which the Steinle Report said was needed to uh, enlarge and uh, renew, refurbish all three of our community hospitals. The University Hospital was very much a part of the committee work, but uh, was not within the scope of the recommendations because that was a state responsibility. But um, the uh, St. Mary's Hospital, <coughs> Madison General Hospital, and Methodist Hospital as our community hospitals uh, were to be the recipients of funds which uh, Steinle had said in a scale of I think, five and a half million dollars for the three. This is for construction and improvement? For, for of construction and improvement, updating. Updating. And, uh, not for daily care. But ma ma mainly, um, no, no, this was not for care. This was mainly for bones and mortar. Um, emergency rooms began to develop then. So well, that people weren't turned away at the hospital, if they. I think we were just on the um, threshold of a period of very rapid change mm -hmm. in the delivery of health care having to do with hospitals. But uh, the federal government, you know, in the 50s or 60s got into the hospital business in a big way and uh, we, yeah, we had a uh, rash of uh, hospital building all over the country, uh, some of it quite ill-advised, being put into places geographically which were to the done best without much planning because it had to be done so quickly. Planning. You're right. But uh, after all, here we had this uh, um, asserted need in uh, Madison for new hospitals, and at the same time there was a real um, effort on the part of many people on the east side of Madison to have a hospital out there too, mm -hmm. or instead. And uh, so the east side hospital became a part of this uh, problem in setting this thing up. Um, the uh, goal for the campaign was first put at five and a half million, where Steinle had proposed it be, and uh, the first thing was that it w 
we got an organization in, not the Steinle organization, but a professional fundraising organization, and as usual in those situations, they uh, made a survey of Madison in order to see what the potential was in their judgment. And they came back to us after a couple months and said, you can't do it five and a half million. The most we can see is three and a half million. Well, there had never been a campaign even on that scale in Madison before mm -hmm. for anything. And uh, this was, you see, the middle 60s by that time. And um, so three and a half million uh, seemed to be, if it were attainable, seemed to be worth mm -hmm. going after. And um, so that became our goal. Then the problem was to um, get um, uh, somebody to head the campaign and set up an organization for it, even with a professional financial um, uh, organization, one needs a I mean, fundraising organization, mm -hmm. one needs local leadership. And uh, that proved to be extremely difficult. I spent a lot of time at that, working mostly with Mr. Leo Crowley, who was in this whole enterprise as a representative of St. Mary's Hospital. I got to know Leo fairly well at that time and uh, became very fond of him. He was really quite a remarkable person. But um, we visited one um, business executive after another and uh, for a variety of reasons that refused all along the way. And uh, finally uh, got uh, Dwayne Bowman to head the campaign. It was the head of uh, Bowman Dairy Company, mm -hmm. and uh, so he did take well, so. We had uh, the organization ready, but uh, still had the problem of what to do about the people who wanted a hospital on the east side of Madison. Mm -hmm. yeah. or something. Like that. The people who were very vocal about wanting a East Side Hospital were perhaps not awfully numerous, but uh, uh, it uh, touched a sensitive uh, chord in Madison because uh, I think there's a, a frequent, uh, frequently manifested feeling uh, among people on the East Side of Madison that uh, they come out second best on so many things. And so, uh, in launching a campaign to raise uh, money for the three community hospitals, we had to deal with the question of what the general impact of that would be among people on the east side, even though uh, the leadership was uh, limited. And um, the result of it was that uh, uh, an agreement was made between the officers of the United Hospital Fund and some organization that the East Side people had developed, uh, that 5% um, of whatever would be raised in the campaign would be uh, put into a, an escrow fund at the Security State Bank out on the East Side, and uh, that um, after 10 years, if uh, there had been no progress whatever in the uh, development of the East of us, hospital facility on the east side, the money that was in that escrow account would then go to the other three hospitals. Uh, in the event, it turned out that uh, nothing did develop, of course, in that line, and eventually the money did go to the other three hospitals. Right, and it changes these emergency room setups that are in the clinics out there and the way of taking care of people. Yes. I don't think there's any longer a uh, cry for uh, an east side hospital. Uh, because everything has changed so much. Uh, not only uh, better ambulance services, but uh, recognition that the uh, costs involved in hospital operation and equipment and so on is so great that it's just beyond the realm of feasibility. And as the city grows, these uh, grows to the west, these three community hospitals are pretty central. central now. They're central now. And uh, this is generally recognized. And uh, so uh, I think time solved that problem, but at the outset of the finance campaign, uh, it was a touchy one, and uh, that's the way it was handled. 
the campaign uh, did not reach the goal of three and a half million. The amount obtained uh, for solicitation pledges uh, was in the order of uh, two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, um, and that, uh, or excuse me, two, 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 two and three quarter million, mm -hmm. two and three quarter million, which was divided up on a formula which. Uh, gave a larger amount to Madison General and the equal amounts to uh, uh, St. Mary's and Methodist. That had been something uh, a little touchy, too, to come by with a formula that they would agree on. And the uh, solution uh, was due to uh, Leo Crowley, whom I mentioned before. He um, proposed that, uh, let's see, what was the division? I hesitate to mention it. But it, it was a larger amount for uh, Madison General Hospital. They were the larger hospital, and an equal amount for St. Mary's and Methodist. And I think it would have been quite possible for uh, Mr. Crowley uh, and others from St. Mary's to have argued that they should have had more than Methodist as of then. But it was his proposal that they and Methodist be put on an equal basis, and uh, that broke the, the log jam. And the, and I was considered him sort of the, the next thing to the Pope. Yes, well, he was knighted by the Pope <laughs> and uh, Madison's leading Catholic, I'm mm. sure. Uh, the other thing that the uh, uh, Committee on Hospitals, which I had chaired, uh, proposed was the formation of a uh, health planning council, which would uh, carry on uh, continuous planning with professional staff uh, instead of just relying on an occasional study like the Steinle Report, in which we were working, but which very quickly gets out of date. So um, we put together an organization, incorporated it as the uh, Health Planning Council for Dane County, but with the potential of expanding outside the county, as uh, need would uh, indicate. And um, there again, I served as president for the first uh, two or three years, it was three, and continued to be active in it for quite a while after that. And uh, I think the Health Planning Council also, like the Community Welfare Council, was a very worthwhile undertaking. Uh, the uh, staff grew to about ten people. Uh, it expanded into eleven counties, the whole southwestern corner of uh, Dane County because the federal government passed legislation... You mean of Wisconsin? Of Wisconsin. South. I said the county, yeah. I guess. I meant Wisconsin. Eleven counties uh, mm -hmm. were incorporated. The uh, federal government adopted legislation which uh, um, provided that every part of the country should belong to a, uh, whatever the term was, health a, planning a, a health planning uh, continuum of mm -hmm. some sort, and uh, while, and so Wisconsin was assigned seven of them, and uh, here all of a sudden, instead of having one county, we were given the responsibility of being the agency uh, for these 11 counties going west to uh, Crawford. And, uh, Way to the river, Mississippi River. Mississippi River, yeah, and down to the south mm -hmm. of uh, the state line. And um, that, of course, was... Uh, very considerable undertaking, but it occurred, and the organization continued to do very useful work until the federal funds for that sort of thing uh, were closed out last year, and the uh, Health Planning it Council had to fold. It did, but before that, though, it exerted a good deal of influence, I didn't think it, it did. in preventing the, the willy nilly development of hospitals. Yeah. One of my personal involvements in that, after I was no longer an officer or even a director, was to um, engage in conversations with our four hospitals here about uh, heart transplants, which um, the um, all four hospitals, well, the university hospital is doing it, and, uh, or I guess it isn't transplants, I'm misspeaking, I mean uh, open heart surgeries. Uh, they had a program at St. Mary's. Um, they were doing a little of it at Methodist, and uh, Madison General wanted it. And uh, the question was, 
not one just of yeah. fairness among the hospitals, but what did the community need when the uh, expert uh, opinion of the time was that uh, uh, such departments weren't apt to do awfully good work unless they had a sufficient volume. Uh, an enormous investment in the equipment. And a lot of money. So uh, the problem was how to uh, handle this assistant uh, thing from uh, Madison General Isn't Hospital. Isn't it strange you get complications over so I diseases? Was, yes. And I was involved in that, I think, for a year or so, where with uh, Paul Fleer, who then was in a good number of years, was the secretary and director of the Health Planning Council, we had these conversations either individually with the representatives of different hospitals or more than one together about uh, how to approach this. We never did make a recommendation that uh, they could, that Madison General should have the program and uh, Meanwhile, again, conditions were shifting and changing all the time, and um, to some extent, the uh, problem sort of went away uh, until a, couple, a year or two ago, whenever the uh, Madison General and Methodist Hospital announced their merger, uh, now called Emeritus uh, Hospital, with two locations, and the shifting of some uh, uh, departments within the two facilities uh, will give Madison General access to open heart surgery, which they didn't have before. But again, that's part of the very, very rapidly uh, changing uh, situation uh, with respect to the delivery of health care everywhere as well as in Madison. And uh, I don't feel at all well informed about it, but at least for a time, I, uh, I was sort of on the cutting edge mm -hmm. of some of these. They, they really do develop rapidly. Yes. And there is the problem about town and gown in the medical profession, isn't there? Yes, yes there's that. They don't even know each other very well in the university there, hospital. There, there still is a friction there, and uh, on the other hand, uh, the doctors themselves are uh, trying to adjust to membership in HMOs and yes. uh, other things to uh, to the uh, circumstances that uh, involve them so much. And uh, liability insurance has become such a problem for them. All kinds of factors that we didn't even talk about One of the things I've been aware of is how long, they, how long the doctors have to wait for their money when it goes through Medicare and Medicaid and yeah, that's all those factor. years sometimes. Well, I've talked about things now down to the uh, 60s and even into the 70s, but uh, to go back again to the 50s, there were some involvements I had then which I might just say something about. Mm -hmm. um, one was uh, well that that was the period when the country became very disturbed and tense over uh, an excessive uh, feeling of danger from the communists mm -hmm. and uh, Wisconsin Senator McCarthy um, uh, took advantage of that by uh, his campaign to route uh, communist uh, sympathizers and actual communists out of government service, particularly in the State Department. I never became active politically in any way, but I just had an instinctive uh, feeling that this was uh, a very harmful thing for our country Bad from the news. very outset uh, Mr. McCarthy, or Senator McCarthy's uh, dealings and uh, charges and speeches. And um, I became involved in it publicly without intending to do so when um, the uh, State Furniture Dealers Association, Wisconsin Furniture Dealers Association, which I had been active at one point as a director was holding its annual convention in Milwaukee and uh, engaged uh, Senator McCarthy as the featured speaker at the banquet for the convention. So uh, I chose not to go and I sent a note to uh, whoever was the officer or the secretary of the association at that time whom I knew <coughs> and said this, that I didn't wish to go because, <coughs> I'm sorry, 
Having told my friends in Milwaukee that I wasn't coming to the convention, I was uh, surprised to get a uh, telephone call from Alvin Pride, a reporter for the Capital Times, whom I knew, and uh, he said that uh, the paper had been called by one of the papers or a reporter in Milwaukee and told about my uh, refusal to uh, go to the convention because Senator McCarthy was going to speak. I uh, hadn't intended that it would be public, but uh, of course uh, Al Pride wanted to know what I had to say about it. And uh, I asked him if I could call him back in about five minutes. And I wrote a brief statement then, which I uh, read to him over the phone uh, when I completed it. And it was published very prominently in uh, the Capital Times uh, that evening, I guess it was, and of course picked up uh, by the State Journal and also by papers all over. Uh, furniture dealer refers to, refuses to uh, hear McCarthy. Mm -hmm. In the statement I uh, tried to say that I felt that it was uh, somewhat of a uh, compliment to any speaker to go to hear him, and I did not choose to pay that compliment to Senator McCarthy because I thought that what he was doing was very harmful to our national interests, particularly in his um, uh, charges and uh, impugning the integrity and uh, patriotism of so many of our government services, particularly in uh, the Foreign Service and State Department. Well, that uh, elicited a great response from people uh, around the community. I uh, think I received about a hundred letters, uh, a few of them uh, supporting me, some in very guarded language, but uh, most of those who bothered to write either to me personally or to the newspapers were quite, uh, um, quite outraged that anybody would... Uh, say such a thing as I had said. And of course there were um, statements in some of these letters and they've never come into our furniture store anymore and uh, that was the end of they that. They probably never did. Well, uh, some of them I think have been uh, customers. But uh, uh, my position was uh, such within the business and uh, the family uh, who didn't particularly support me in this that um, I uh, didn't want to carry it any farther and so I made no more statements or wrote no more letters and wrote more, no more letters and uh, that gradually died down as uh, others carried on the campaign which eventuated in the Joe Must Go movement and the eventual uh, I guess it was self-destruction of Senator McCarthy. But uh, that was a, an unwelcome um, incident in my life, but uh, one which I've had no regrets about. Yeah, it's great. Um, other things that happened along, a little after that, uh, had to do with uh, Madison questions, which were very divisive. Uh, but where one didn't get the uh, repercussions necessarily, uh, whichever side he might be on. One of them had to do with the Monona Terrace plan. Eventually drew in almost everybody. Yes, and, uh, yeah, uh, as a member of the, uh, as an as a active person in the Community Welfare Council, I had had something to do with the, uh, with the study made for Madison's recreational needs uh, and um, published a report on that and it had quite a little to do about the need for a community center and uh, what it should contain and that kind of thing. That was part of my uh, involvement in such a question but mostly it was just a matter of interest as a citizen that uh, it would be fine if Madison could have an auditorium and uh, 
a facility for so many different purposes as, as we're being outlined for it. And um, uh, that had been going on ever since um, before World War II, uh, interrupted, of course, by that, but uh, uh, came to life again uh, following the war. And uh, it was a very slow process to get city government and uh, other people uh, on a track which would lead toward the creation of a community center such as uh, was talked about. Well, eventually uh, the city council um, decided that uh, we should have such a facility and that the way to start was to uh, issue uh, bonds uh, in the amount of $4 million, which would uh, provide the means for such a facility. And uh, the uh, matter had to go to a referendum, which happened in the spring of 1954. And um, it was a simple issue of approval of bonds, nothing unusual about it at all. But there were uh, people uh, in Madison, and they were a very articulate and vocal group, who uh, wanted Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright to uh, design the building and uh, wanted it to be on uh, Monona Terrace, uh, right off the end of what was then Monona Avenue. And this uh, was based upon a proposal which Mr. Wright had made uh, before World War II, uh, back in 1938 or 9, I think it was, uh, when uh, the city and county had just about reached agreement on uh, building a joint building uh, on Monona Avenue as a city-county building, the sort of thing we did eventually yeah, yeah. get. But um, the uh, people, uh, Mr. Wright's uh, proposal of uh, that year in the late 30s was for a grandiose structure which would incorporate all sorts of things, an auditorium theater, a, um, an art gallery, but also hotels, a railroad station, um, and um, lots of parking and everything else and be a uh, marvelous uh, uh, site uh, from across the lake or even from above, I suppose. Um, the uh, war had put a stop to that, but uh, people remembered it, and uh, uh, that was the basis for this uh, uh, situation that uh, developed with respect to the uh, uh, referendum in the spring of 1954. The, uh, the group supporting Mr. Wright's plan um, argued that uh, the uh, referendum should, incorporate, should include the naming of Mr. Wright as the architect and Monona Terrace as a site for it. And um, uh, the city council um, actually decided to uh, break up the referendum into three different parts on those three different issues. First, the approval of a $4 million bond issue. Secondly, that it, the, the center be built on Monona Terrace. Third, mm -hmm. that um, Mr. Wright be the architect, but it could be uh, these three parts could be voted on separately. And uh, I remember talking to Ivan Nestigan about it. He was an alderman from, uh, I think it was the 8th Ward. Uh, yeah, wards yeah. are somewhat different now, yeah. but that was a student ward. And um, he, uh, he told me that while he had previously opposed the uh, idea of voting on the place and the architect, uh, that uh, he just felt he had to switch. And so he made that change, and he was chairman of the auditorium committee on the city council, and his change, I think, was what uh, caused the, um, the uh, referendum to be uh, worded as it was. Uh, meanwhile, the people who uh, wanted the referendum to go through, but not to approve Mr. Wright or 
uh, or the Monona Terrace as a site, you know, were not active at all. They were playing it quietly, thinking these things would never carry. They thought that uh, Mr. Wright didn't have that kind of following, except for this very yes, local, local and enemies. And he had he had real critics here, so uh, they uh, they didn't say anything. And I thought that that was a uh, mistake. And I wrote a letter, which I sent identical letter copies to both newspapers, uh, saying that uh, I thought that uh, it was too bad that uh, we were being asked to vote on the site and on the architect, that uh, the site proposed and the architect proposed should be considered, of course, but they should be considered by an expert commission of some sort or, or a delegation of authority to make that determination, the only thing we should really approve would be to uh, um, uh, approve the bonds. And um, that was picked up and played up very proudly, front page of both newspapers with editorial comment and all that sort of thing, and I began to get letters about that, some of which Can made me wild radical of feeling a little bit, well, no, here I was an arch-conservative, I no. guess was the problem. An enemy of the people. Uh, well, uh, and uh, artistically blind and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So it made me feel a little badly about some of the individuals who uh, made such comments, but that wasn't comparable to the uh, emotional involvement in the McCarthy thing, they were quite different. Anyhow, uh, the outcome, of course, was that um, the uh, on the three questions. The bond issue was overwhelmingly approved. The uh, Monona Terrace was uh, approved by a smaller margin, and uh, the selection of Mr. Wright as architect was approved too, but by just the barest of margins. So we had that situation, and the rest is history as to all the uh, things that happened uh, and didn't happen. And effectively put a stop to the Yes, uh, and years. it was many years before uh, we finally got a uh, community center theater and so on on State Street, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, which is not, nobody had in mind at the time. Which is perhaps a, a dubious solution, but at least uh, we got something done. Uh, still a, another uh, thing that happened in that period, and this is how I happened to get to know Ivan Nestigan quite well. Um, there was a uh, push by merchants, particularly on the um, west side of the square and down State Street, to uh, get parking. Uh, people already, this was the post-war years, and people already were beginning to feel the pinch downtown and their businesses because uh, people couldn't get there and park conveniently. And so um, uh, there's a proposal for taking Block 53, which is bounded by uh, Fairchild and uh, Johnson and, or uh, it's two blocks, uh, Johnson uh, or Dayton is uh, the boundary of, uh, West Dayton is the boundary of uh, block 53 itself, and then I don't know which is the next one, Bloom or something down there, and uh, Mifflin. But anyway, that whole block, which was uh, uh, crowded with uh, buildings, mostly uh, wooden three-story structures, houses, which uh, had been built on half lots, very close together, and were lived in to some extent by student renters, but uh, also by a lot of people who lived there for many years, some of them How quite elderly, and uh, <coughs> not very well to do. It was uh, similar in general aspect to uh, uh, the blocks as we look still down beyond there was Mifflin Street and so on. And um, uh, it was thought that uh, the city should acquire that old block and uh, put it into parking. And then there, of course, was the question of what would happen to people who live there. And uh, at a uh, city council meeting where this was being considered, a uh, group of merchants uh, headed by George Hall, who'd been a city councilman, uh, proposed that um, they, they would raise a fund of $30,000, which would be a hardship fund uh, for the benefit of these people who would be hurt and being uh, dislocated. So uh, the city council, with that 
promise for them uh, moved on it and uh, decided to go ahead and condemn the property in that block and put it into parking. Uh, then the question was, how is this thirty thousand dollars going to be administered? And also, it had to be raised, uh, which was the responsibility of uh, George Hall and his uh, fellow uh, merchants, but um, uh, businessmen. But the uh, expenditure of the money uh, through the uh, Chamber of Commerce was another matter, and uh, the Chamber asked me if I would chair a committee which uh, would uh, uh, consider that and, uh, and handle the distribution of the uh, hardship fund. Uh, along with myself, uh, people appointed to it were Ivan Mestigan, who was the uh, alderman in that ward, uh, Mrs. Sophie Seebecker, who was the uh, very much respected uh, head of Family Service Agency. Um, Robert Peck, who was out of the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce or, uh, personnel, uh, Mrs. Joe Wilson, who was a social worker, uh, Walter Shar, uh, the father of President Walter Shar or Terry Shar, who was uh, in the insurance business, and myself. And uh, we first had to discussed the problem, we agreed that uh, just to hand out money to anybody who came asked for it uh, couldn't be done. It doesn't wouldn't last very long. It wouldn't last very long. And uh, so uh, with the advice particularly of Mrs. Seebecker, we uh, got another social worker, one of her caseworkers out of her organization, Miss uh, Steensland. Uh, some information about themselves, and um, uh, then uh, that was to be followed by an interview by Ms. Steensland and a report to our committee which would make case-by-case uh, -case, uh, determinations. And um, so that was what was done. Um, it was interesting to me that Ivan Nestigan, uh, who had made such a impassioned plea with the City Council for uh, these constituents of his who lived in that block and how uh, much they were going to be hurt by all this and so on, turned out, I thought, to be an extremely reasonable person as mm -hmm. we talked these matters over. And uh, everything we ever did was always by unanimous agreement. The uh, uh, number of people who made actual applications was not very large. Uh, I guess maybe they were turned off by the need to fill out forms with uh, personal financial mm -hmm. detail and that kind of thing. And uh, the amounts that they requested after interviews with uh, Steam Fund had to do with very specific items, not just general hardship. Uh, need a stove because they won't have one. Uh, need an ice box or a you know, refrigerator for the same reason. Or, uh, my job just won't support the kind of rent I'm going to have to pay, but they also had to know what the new rent was going to be, mm -hmm. so it was an actual dollar amount differential between what they had been paying and what the new uh, location would require, and uh, so on. And on those rental cases where we uh, supplemented, it was uh, agreed that it would last only for 12 months, which would give people a time to make personal adjustments and so on. So uh, that's what happened, uh, and um, I think that George Hall and his associates actually raised only about six or seven thousand dollars, and even that wasn't all spent. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the outcome of that, and that's how I happened to get to know uh, Ivan quite well. And then, when he was elected mayor, one of the first things he did was to say that uh, he was going to inaugurate a uh, new period in Madison's history by setting up a, a large committee to study the uh, uh, future of the city and its needs and uh, proposals. And uh, he uh, appointed 
this committee, which he called the uh, Metropolitan Development Committee, with uh, Attorney Jack DeWitt as the overall chairman, and uh, subcommittees, which uh, one was uh, uh, government, governmental and administrative subcommittee with Professor Jake Boisher of the law school as chairman, and a considerable number of people, they were dealing with uh, the uh, relationship between Madison as a municipality and the uh, other communities surrounding Madison in the metropolitan area, and particularly about uh, ways of better coordination or even the development of a, a common government for the whole area. Mm -hmm. And uh, another committee was uh, called the Central Area Development Committee, which was headed by Horace Wilkie, and uh, that also uh, had some subcommittees and uh, brought in reports. But I was asked both to be on the I was asked to uh, be on the steering committee and also to uh, head a subcommittee on the fiscal and economic base for for Madison and the whole area, and uh, agreed to do that and um, found it to be a very instructive. Mm -hmm. uh, engagement for me because of the other people who were on the committee. They were uh, Professor Harold Groves of the Economics Department, uh, Ms. Clara Penniman of the uh, Political Science Department at the University, um, Ted Malloy, the president of the Bank of Madison, uh, Arthur Altmeyer, who had just returned to Madison after his years in Washington as head of uh, Social Security uh, Division of Government, um, Jim Doyle, your husband, mm -hmm. uh, Pat Lucy, uh, Hugh Ingersoll, and I think there are one or two others. Uh, for me, it was really like a seminar, and I learned a great deal, and it was interesting to associate with these folks. Uh, the most active members of the committee were um, Groves, Penniman, and Altmeyer, as well as myself, I mean, as far as committee attendance is concerned, Hugh Ingersoll, a younger person, um, died before our report was um, finally issued, but uh, he did write a portion of it. Pat Lucy, I don't recall that uh, he came to meetings uh, very often. But anyway, it was an interesting and very well informed, intelligent group, high grade group. And uh, uh, the whole committee produced a, a rather extensive report, of which the bulkiest part by far was um, the report of our committee uh, with charts and uh, data, uh, papers written by staff members. We did have staff because uh, it must saw that these committees were uh, provided with funds and um, papers written by uh, the rest of us individually. I wrote one, I remember, on uh, uh, industrial development for Madison and the surrounding area. Well, so one, how, 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 do you have any idea how close we come to there in the ensuing years? I never okay. had any way of judging whether... It seems to me a lot of industry has left Madison and a lot of insurance, economic insurance businesses, that kind of business has come. Well, it'd be interesting to reread the report, mm -hmm. but after all, I'm talking about 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we brought it out in 1957, so it is just 30, 30 years, and uh, details like that. Would make an interesting yeah. paper for some graduate student to work on. Well, maybe so. Uh, I took a glance at it just this morning, knowing mm -hmm. that we were going to be uh, talking about this. Uh, and uh, well, I certainly didn't read it all. I saw that uh, in what I had written, that there was a projection that the population of Madison uh, along about uh, 1975 would be a neighborhood of 180,000. Well, that isn't answering your question, but at least on that particular thing, we're very close to the very mark. Close, yeah. But of course, the growth that's occurred has been outside of Madison. Yes. It's the metropolitan area that's so much bigger, yes. and that highlights the uh, need for uh, more coordination in government. It's still being talked about, of mm -hmm. course, in the present campaign for county executive. Yeah. 
But uh, that was what Jake Osher was real for wrestling with. Uh, mm -hmm. You could come about with some kind of uh, metropolitan uh, government. I uh, don't know. Uh, I think as a matter of interest, I should reread what I had to say about uh, industrial development, but I saw enough in just glancing at it this morning to see that some of the problems were uh, not unlike those which we still have. Yeah, uh, never for one thing, a division of opinion in Madison as to whether we want to be an industrialized city or not. Uh, there, there are people in Madison think our boundaries should stay absolutely rigid and our population should not be allowed to grow. Mm -hmm. So if you have extra children, you have to move out of town. Uh, you certainly have different opinions. And uh, also different potential because it was pointed out in the material that uh, Industries which came here uh, found difficulty in finding sites, mm -hmm. particularly within the city where they wanted to be and near other similar plants. And the sites were just weren't available. I don't remember out of that period any any talk about how the state must invest money and give loans to businesses to move in and all that. The stuff we go through now seems to be so peculiarly new. Yeah. The governor who runs around offering loans for five million dollars to yeah. people to establish and yeah. giving them sight. So yeah. Inducements. Well, in the case of Wisconsin, I think it's a matter of ketchup. Other states have been doing mm -hmm. that much longer. Yeah, probably. Sort and of a uh, communist solution <laughs> for a capitalist socialist. society. Yeah. In a way. Um, but uh, there, there have been so many changes uh, which I think weren't foreseen in the late 50s when this report came out, uh, particularly the um, almost complete change in the nature of downtown, mm -hmm. no longer the center of retail. And the mushroom growth on the west end of town. Yes, and to some extent on the east end and everywhere else too, but uh, the empty storefronts and so on. We weren't talking about things like that then because that came later. Well, Manchester was still doing good big business. Mm -hmm. Well, Kubli was there. And but as to the report itself, whether it uh, had much effect, I have no way of knowing. Uh, I wasn't in that instance on any follow-up committee about mm -hmm. any part of this or anything. It's just the involvement in it with these wonderful people. Mm -hmm. that, education. Uh, with your educational coming. I just want to make one comment about this, uh, about this mm -hmm. whole interview. Everything that you, you've been involved with, it reveals a very interesting thing about you. Everything you've been involved with, you were you were in on the beginning, and you were the first chairman, and you uh, then served on the board after you, but you were involved in getting things started, time after time after time. Well, that's an interesting comment. I have sometimes thought myself that when I got into some of these matters about um, social services and later health services, I was way over my head as far as knowledge is concerned of what I could do to help bring people together and get things get going. Get them going, yeah. Which is a marvelous contribution. You can take great pride. Hi, thank you.